Everyone is waiting for something, someone, sometimes anticipating, sometimes agonizing. We all have an expectation for what's to come. Even Jesus arrived with a wait. Although we turn a single page, 400 years of silence spanned the gap between the final prophecies we read in the Old Testament and the birth of Jesus. No prophet, no voice, no signs, no wonders. You can almost hear the questions. Did God care? Had he vanished? Was he ever really there? Finally, with a single cry in a stable in Bethlehem, the silence was broken. The arrival of a baby born in the midst of darkness and despair was hope fulfilled, a miracle in motion. And the good news? In the same way it did 2,000 years ago, Advent brings with it the assurance that no matter what you're waiting on, God promises hope is on the way. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Are you well this morning? It is good to see you. And uh, for those of you who I have not met yet, my name is Anna. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so excited to be diving into another week in this Advent series. A special welcome to everyone joining us online this morning. I'm so glad that we can be with you. Uh, so the end of the year, right? It's December officially. And so I've been reflecting on the year that's been. I've been thinking through kind of all that's happened. And I realized that it's been about just over three years since I moved to the Gold Coast. And I did recently one of those things that only Gold Coast locals can do. I did something that I thought I would never have done. I realized that I'm very much part of the furniture now. And you're probably trying to guess what that is, but trust me, I don't think you'll guess. A few months ago, I bought an annual pass to the theme parks. <laughs> Who would have thought? That's something that if you live on the coast, it's a rite of passage, it only makes sense, and you always ask the question, will I make the most of this pass? And I've only been once, and it's been about six weeks, but when I did go, it was glorious. I went to Movie World, and I had that experience where you feel like you're superior because you have an annual pass. I walked in and saw everyone else lining up, and I... Like, it's like I was VIP with the other thousands of people who have annual passes. I flashed my phone that has my photo identification with my uh, pass to get in for the year, walked straight on through. And I had that feeling like I was a kid again. I wonder if that happens for you if you go to a theme park. You, you flash back to feeling like you are young and that it's exciting. You can smell the stale popcorn, the smell of metal and plastic never smelt so good. And you are excited and enticed by these huge roller coasters. And when I was little, I loved going to theme parks. I've always loved rides. I had to, uh, you know, beg dad to come onto the rides with me, all of them. And the best rides are always the ones that are the biggest and the fastest. My favorite at Movie World at the moment is the Superman ride. Um, I heard one amen, awesome. And so the thing is though, when you're a kid, the roller coasters, they seem so huge. Uh, the, it seems so fast. And the best rides, the biggest and the fastest, always have those pesky height restrictions. I wonder if you remember when you were a kid, you would line up and you would feel as tall as you could. You'd have the best posture. You'd wear your sand shoes or your runners that had the thickest padding so that you could be as tall as you could. And I empathize with those kids that don't make it on, the distraught nature. And my favorite thing happened in the 8 a.m. service where Jason, Pastor Jason said, I know the feeling. 
<laughs> so Jace, my, <laughs> I empathise with you, mate. Um, but that feeling of not getting on the roller coaster, not quite making it, breaks my heart. If I was to design a, a theme park, I would make sure that there were no height restrictions. All could experience the glory of the rides. There would be no more tears. There would be no more suffering. Only the beauty of the roller coasters. Thank you, claps, awesome. And so I think that there's something in us though that, that hates the idea that some get in and some get out. The fact that some people are excluded from things of great beauty, roller coasters in this, in this case. But in other examples, you know, there's, there's something in us, in how we are designed to, to be at, at conflict with the fact that there's just injustice, to be uh, shaken by the fact that, you know, some people have access to education and some people don't, that some people get access to food and others don't. Perhaps there's trauma where you've remembered a time of exclusion Maybe it was just a birthday party in primary school, but you didn't get an invitation and that stuck with you. Maybe it's those ways in primary school where you choose people on your sports team. And I hope teachers in the room that we don't do that anymore, where you go, I wanna choose that person and that person, I swear psychologists have had to work through deep trauma in a lot of people over that. But in our very essence, the idea that people are excluded doesn't sit right. And what I love is that the story of Christmas, from the very, very beginning, before Jesus has even said a word, at his birth, we see this strategic design where God from the beginning shows that the gospel, the good news that is in Jesus Christ is accessible for anyone and everyone. It's good news. And so today I hope we're going to look at two extremes of people who came uh, to the birth of Jesus and how they were accepted and how they worshipped and adored Christ. And in looking at the extremes, hopefully we'll find ourselves somewhere in the middle to include ourselves in the story. So how about you jump in with me to Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 12. We read here. And there were sheep living out in the fields nearby. Sorry, there were shepherds living with the sheep, obviously. Uh, Just checking. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So who have we got in the scene? What, what is this passage unpacking for us? What's going on? So firstly, we know that we've got shepherds. And what do we know about shepherds? We know that in this era, shepherds were classified as the lowly. They were classified as those who perhaps were uneducated, those who were pushed out to the outskirts of society. They weren't necessarily those who were learned and at the top of the socioeconomic rank. So shepherds, they were out in the field and they were actually considered, some would say, as unclean. And so these people, they're out, they're working, they're on night duty, We wonder if the sky was filled with stars and there was a bright, shining, full moon, or we wonder if there was cloud cover and it was freezing and dark and pitch black. We wonder if they were dozing off and tired or alert and awake. But what we do know is that with shepherds, what they would do is they would uh, gather the flock, gather, gather the sheep, and they would uh, find them into a cave or uh, perhaps into a pen of such, and they would themselves lie down along the gate or the entrance so that sheep couldn't get out and also so that predators couldn't get in. 
It was a way that they, during the night, were able to keep watch and to physically lay their life down for these sheep. And so into this scene, into this blurry-eyed, tired, perhaps cold, maybe smelly and, and wet shepherds, comes an angel of the Lord. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being woken up? And it says that the glory of the Lord shone around them to this bright shining of an angel. And naturally, it says that they were terrified. You and me both, boys. I would have been terrified. We all would. So an angel of the Lord appears to these shepherds, these outcasts, these unclean people. And what does the angel say? We read here, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So these shepherds were Jewish men or Jewish boys probably. And they would have traditionally known you know, the scriptures. They would have traditionally known the religious kind of storyline that had gone on. So they weren't necessarily scholars. They may not have been able to recite it. Uh, but they would have noticed in what the angel said, there were a few triggering words. So we read here that it was in the city or the town of David. You know, that was a prophecy that was spoken in previous years. Perhaps the shepherds knew that, maybe they didn't. Another triggering word would have been that it's a, the Saviour, the Messiah, the Lord. These would have definitely, regardless of how learned these men were, they would have definitely recognised the significance and the importance of what these angels were heralding. The fact that a Saviour has been born and he will be the Messiah, the one who will save you from your sins. He will be the Lord. And so these shepherds would have been amazed. I wonder if they were thinking, I wonder if an angel is appearing to everyone right now. If this is being kind of told to all those around, or are we the only ones? Why us? Why is this happening now for us? We're just the shepherds. And, and so they were amazed at this declaration, this heralding of the angels. But what's even more incredible is that they were actually invited to visit him. These shepherds out in the fields were invited to come to the birthplace of the King of Kings. Absolutely amazing. Kenneth Bailey, he is a, uh, a scholar in Middle Eastern culture and he brings a lot of kind of unknown light into these stories, brings us in our Western culture a bit more insight. And, and he writes that these shepherds were actually the first people in which the angels of the Lord declared the birth of the coming Messiah. The first people. The fact that God chose to reveal himself to shepherds first in and of itself is scandalous. But not only were they told about it, like I said, they were, they were asked to visit this child. From their point of view, if the child was indeed the Messiah, what would have made them think that they would be welcome? Why would they, when they arrived at the house, been given a nice warm welcome of, oh good shepherds, we were expecting you, please come in to see the King and Kings and Lord of Lords? No, who would have expected that the shepherds would have any right to enter into such a place? Except for the fact of what the angels declared, that you will find him wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. You wouldn't suspect that. You wouldn't have thought that the Messiah King was going to be born in a manger. Why not in the Holy of Holies and a temple or a palace, his royalty, King of the Jews? Why a manger? Kenneth Bailey writes this. He was not in a governor's mansion or a wealthy merchant's guest room, but in a simple two-room home like theirs. This was really good news. Perhaps they would not be told, unclean shepherds, be gone. Wrapped 
in cloths was something that the lowly and the poor and the peasants did with their babies. Not wrap them or adorn them in silk, but wrapping them in cloth. That for them was an invitation of welcome. But secondly, that they were found in a manger. What do we know about mangers? Not much, unless you've got one in your house. I don't know much about mangers. So I did a little bit of digging, a little bit of research to find out what exactly was a manger. Because if you're anything like me, a lot of the Christmas story was filled in for you during your participation in like your kindergarten play. And I was always the sheep. Year after year, still the sheep. Anyway, I always wanted to be Mary. Anyway, just not going to process that on the stage. Um, So the idea is that we know this story because of tradition, our Western 21st century tradition. But what about Middle Eastern tradition? What's a manger to them? And the fact is that most houses, uh, just local, you know, every ordinary, everyday people had a house and they had a one-room house or a two-room house. A one-room house was like just a big family room. A two-room house included a guest room. And that guest room would either be next door to the family room or, in fact, it would be upstairs. And so you would have flashbacks to... uh, Scenes in the Old Testament where they would go up to the guest room, which was upstairs, which is most likely actually on the flat roof of the commoner's home. So what we hear is that Jesus was born in a manger and we automatically think, okay, stable, animals everywhere, like this is so lowly place for a saviour to be born. But actually, it's a very just ordinary place for a saviour to be born in the sense of It was what the common people had. And why were there animals in the room? Because for these people, animals were their livelihood. It was their investment. It was their money under the mattress. It was their security into their future. So why would they leave their most prized possessions out in the cold, in the rain, and open to theft overnight? They wouldn't. No one would dream of that. And so they would bring the animals where? into their family room, into their manger. And so what we read is that Jesus was born in a manger, which is the family room. Why? Because the guest room was full. We read that it says that the inn was full. And this Greek word for inn is not necessarily used for a commercial inn. It's a different word than, say, when Luke talks about uh, the Good Samaritan taking the, the hurt man to an inn. It's a completely different word. And so this inn is saying that not a commercial inn with no vacancies, but rather the guest room was full. Why is all this important? Because from the very beginning, from the scene that we see the the Christ born into this world is in a very ordinary setting. And why is that good news? Because the shepherds were welcome they too recognised that this home was just like theirs. They were accepted into a place just like theirs. He was placed in a manger in the family room because the guest room was already full. The host family graciously welcomed Mary and Joseph in amongst their family, in amongst their animals, into the family room of their home And that home was so similar to what the shepherds would have had. Middle Eastern culture is high on hospitality. They would have given such inclusive nature to Mary and Joseph and then also extended that to the shepherds. So this is incredible because from the beginning, the shepherds were welcome, the lowly were welcome, the outcast were welcome. Those with uh, not much education, those that society had pushed to the side. At the most incredible time in history, they were welcome. Who else was welcome at this time? We read later, not only shepherds, but also the rich and the wise who brought very expensive gifts. Come with me to Matthew 2. We're going to read verses 1 and 2 and then 9 and 12, 9 to 12. He writes this, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, 
during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So this uh, this story, this passage, actually begs a lot of questions. It's quite bizarre to be reading this. And, And my sense is that we don't find it bizarre because we're so familiar with it. We, we know about the wise men, they bring the gifts, gold, frankincense and myrrh, and it, it's all very lovely and they come and they present them in the stable with the animals. And we've become so familiar with it that maybe we lose out on the scandalous nature that's actually presented here in Matthew's gospel. So the questions that this might raise is, who are the Magi? I thought they were called wise men or the three kings. Um, we actually, as Michael said a couple of weeks ago, we don't know how many they were. What we do know is that they're wealthy, so probably didn't travel alone. So we we know that these magis are coming, and where are they coming from? They're coming from the east. Where's the east? Who are these people? Why are they coming and following a star? And, And if they're from the east, why do they care about something that's happening in a holy land? So there's a number of questions that arise here. And and we're going to unpack a few of them just so that we can again see the intricacy, the strategy that God sets up so that we can know from the beginning that Jesus is the king for anyone and everyone. So what we, the question that we ask is, okay, who are these magi? And if they're coming from the east, where are they coming from? So magi... uh, You're right to think that these are wise men, they're kings, they're wealthy, and they're coming from the east. So the east from from where? Where's your starting point to say they're coming from the east? So if you're in the Holy Land and you're declaring that someone's coming from the east, they're probably on the Jordanic Desert. So on the other side of the Jordan in the desert there. And that desert also then links up with the Arabic Desert. And so these magi, they're coming from the east in the Arabic desert and they're watching a star. In your translation in verse 2, it might say a star from the east uh, or it might say the rising star or the star in its rising or a rose kind of nature. The word east there is, is saying that it's a star in its rising, kind of the sun is rising from the east as the stars are rising from the east. Because if you're logical, you think they're from the east, the star's in the east, and they're following the star, why aren't they in India? If you're geographically minded. If you're not, um, we're thinking (laughs) that if they're in the east, they're from the Arabic desert. Why is that important? Because in the Arabic desert, it's not necessarily Jewish country. Which means that these people, these magi, are not necessarily Jews. What does it mean? That they're Gentiles. And how do we know that they're from actually southern Arabia? It's because the gifts that they bring, gold is mined in Arabia, and then frankincense and myrrh are both uniquely grown on the trees only found in southern Arabia. And you are, these kings are coming with the national emblems, the national identity of where they're from to present them to this new king. And so... The fact that they're Gentiles should really amaze us. Judging by your faces, maybe not so much. (laughs) Because, rightly so, you might be thinking, well, Anna, today, Christians and non-Christians alike celebrate Christmas. Gosh, we, we celebrate with gifts. Why is this so important? This is something that we do all the time. And I would say why this is different is because not only were these wise men, these magis, coming to pay perhaps due respect to a new king that has been uh, 
born and who's been given such title, they're not only bringing due respect through gifts, but it says that they bow down and worship. I don't know about you, but my my non-Christian friends at Christmas aren't bowing down and worshiping Jesus. Something evoked in these kings, in these magi, to recognize not only the significance of this, but the fact that they need to bow down and worship. Furthermore to that, if that wasn't enough, what we then see is that after they've encountered Jesus, after they've had this moment of worship, they then have a dream to bypass King Herod, who is uh, kind of reigning over that time, to bypass him and go back to their country. Why would they do that if not they were impacted greatly in a dream? And what we see here is after encounter and worship, they then act in obedience. And I believe that when we encounter Jesus, when we adore him and worship him, we respond in a way of obedience. We respond in a way of following him. And so did the Magi give their lives to Christ? No, we don't know that. But what we do see is evidence that they knew this significance. They knew that they were welcome there and they responded in both worship and obedience. It's it's incredible that from the very beginning, the first scene where Jesus is born into this earth, where, where the Christ is born, is both for the shepherds, those on the outskirts, those with little wealth, with little knowledge, they are welcome, but also those rich, wise men who came from a different religious background, who were not included in their Abrahamic covenant as such, who were not, you know, wanting to declare this person as their king and their their, uh, Messiah, but recognised the moment that in history was happening. It's beautiful. It is amazing that at the beginning, all are welcome. The, The Christmas story, what we celebrate what we know so well is so much more than a story. It, it asks us to think it through. It begs us to ask the questions, to understand, God, what did you do here? What was at work? Why did you design things like this? Why, why this strategy? And I believe that just like Jesus said throughout his ministry, uh, this is also true at the birth, is that Jesus is the image of the Father. He said, if you want to know the Father, look to me. I don't do anything except what I see the Father doing. I am the exact representation of my Heavenly Father. They are one. They are unified. And I believe at Jesus' birth, again, we're getting a glimpse into the Father heart of God. We are getting a glimpse into the fact that He wants to present Himself as a God who's accessible, as a God who's inclusive, as a God who removes those pesky height barriers, the one that says, don't worry about that, come on in. Enjoy the gift of salvation. Ask me to be in relationship with you because it's what I long to be in with you. So there's so many things uh, that can be seen in the gospel story. There's so many things that we can see in the birth of Jesus, countless. But I just want to highlight three things that I believe God has really uh, put on my heart for our church community in particular this morning. So the first thing is that Jesus removes the barriers. Jesus removes the barriers. And we see this like we've unpacked with shepherds and wise kings. But also, he does it consistently in his ministry, and I believe he still does this today. The fact of who he chooses to encounter, who he chooses to publicly uh, lift up and publicly uh, be associated with, and the people that he heals and and, uh, extends forgiveness for their sins is radical in all of his ministry. We see it at the birth like we've just seen, but we also see it in his death and resurrection. The fact that he, uh, in Matthew 28, reveals himself to women after he has been resurrected. They're the outcast. That's, that's a very intentional step of God's. But also, we see this in the times that he 
uh, publicly for those who are considered outcasts, for those who are considered frauds, those who are tax collectors at the time. What does he say to Zacchaeus in Luke 19? He says that salvation has come to this house for the Saviour has come to seek and save the lost. He is looking for those who are on the outskirts to say, come on in. I'm removing those barriers. Even though society puts them up, I tear them down. Who does he publicly affirm? But the woman who comes and weeps at his feet and wipes his feet with her hair. People that the Pharisees said, she shouldn't even be here. He is the one who publicly affirms her. He also heals those uh, with, with withered hands, with blindness. For those who are paraplegic, he extends healing and salvation and affirmation to those who society pushes to the outskirts. He does it all the way through his ministry. It's because it's who he is. It's because it's who God is. He, re he removes the barriers. The gospel is inclusive. The, the gospel is accessible. There is no criteria that you need to meet. There is no prerequis prerequisite that you need to have fulfilled. There is no sense of perfection or altogether that you need to have before God will extend his love and his grace and his truth to you. Yeah. All have fallen short of the glory of God. All <laughs> means all. Yeah. We all have. So God has removed that barrier to extend invitation for you to be made right through the gift of salvation. Secondly, we need to do likewise. If Jesus makes a very big effort at removing those barriers, even at the birth, we too need to make sure that we are removing those barriers, that we are not getting in the way of the gospel, that the gospel is still good news for those that we encounter. What's interesting is in all these moments where Jesus comes and, and tries to correct some social order, who gets upset? Not the other outcasts, the Pharisees. And I am challenged to think, have there been times that I, with all the right standing in my heart and all the right intentions of wanting to keep uh, true to the scriptures and true to my convictions, have I got in the way and created barriers for people in order to encounter the love of God? And that's a challenge I always want to be questioning on myself because I want to replicate Jesus in all that I can. I want to be like him. I want to remove the barriers for those to accept and love Jesus. I don't want to get in the way. I want the gospel to be good news. And thirdly, it begs the question, well, how will you respond? Knowing this information is great. It won't do anything unless we act upon it. And the challenge that I have for myself and for you this morning is, is how will we, like the shepherds, respond? We read in Luke chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. It says this, When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. After they had worshipped, after they had encountered, what did they do? They spread the word. And then what did the Holy Spirit do? He did a work upon them so that they were amazed. I am deeply challenged to think this Christmas having encountered Jesus in beautiful gatherings like this, having encountered Jesus in my everyday life, how am I then spreading the word so that people can be amazed? It's not my job to amaze them. It's my job to spread the word. And I don't need to have the gospel memorized. I don't need to know all the answers. I don't need to know what to say but I wanna extend invitation. I wanna create opportunity where people can encounter Jesus. 
I want to create opportunity where they can see people worshipping, can see people adoring Christ, can have the Holy Spirit stir in them and, and pose curiosity and questions as to why. But this Christmas, I, I want to really embody the fact that this gospel is for anyone and everyone. And I want to think if it's accessible, if it's inclusive, how can I make it invitational? That's my part. And you know, we have these invitations for you to take every week. You're able to take these and extend invitation to people in your world. And if you don't listen to anything else out of this message but this, I hope that you're encouraged to invite people to Christmas this year. Spread the word so that people can be amazed. Not by us, but by encountering Jesus. Encountering His beautiful, inclusive gospel. So who are you going to invite this year? Who are you going to spread the word to? Who are you going to watch become alive and amazed by the glory and the goodness of God? Would you stand with me? We're going to finish out today's service doing exactly that, worshipping and adoring God to give Him the, the glory that He deserves, the adoration, just like the shepherds, just like the wise men, and just like all of us in between. We are able to come to be before the, the King of Kings, our Messiah, our Saviour, and to worship Him. But with where you are right now, maybe one of those three points is standing out to you. Maybe you're thinking, gosh, I, I didn't realise that I could come just as I am before Jesus. I didn't realise I was welcome. I knew about Him, but I didn't know that there was a call for me to visit Him or to, to worship Him, to know Him. I didn't think I was welcome. And maybe today you're recognising that, that Jesus has torn down those barriers for you. You are welcome. Maybe you're convicted that there's been times in your life where maybe you've got things wrong and you've set up barriers where the, where the gospel has been limited because we've got in the way. And maybe today you're just wanting to have a moment with God to say sorry for those times or to be empowered to know how to do that going forward. Or maybe God's convicting you about who you can spread the word to, who can be amazed, who, who can be brought into this environment and experience and encounter a living God. So would you pray with me and join me as we just kind of cover a little bit of that and then we're going to respond in worship. So Lord Jesus, I thank you for your gospel message of salvation that is accessible to all of us, that does not require anything of us, but a heart that is willing to receive you. Lord, I pray for those who maybe for the first time are recognising the truth that is your accessible and inclusive gospel. That you accept them just as they are. That you long to be in relationship with them. That they are right just as they are, how you perfectly designed them. And they just need to know that you long to do relationship. That they are in need of a saviour and that your grace and your truth can step in and come alongside them. Lord, for those of us who are feeling challenged by the thought of maybe setting up barriers where you've knocked them down, Lord, will you help us to have wisdom and understanding to make sure that the gospel is good news to all those who we encounter. Lord, that we don't get in the way, but rather you use us through your Holy Spirit to be able to be ambassadors of you, to point people to you, that people will see us and see a glimpse of the Father's heart. Lord, will you continue to transform us more into your likeness? Thank you that you don't give up on us when we get it wrong, but rather you give us your Holy Spirit to continue to re refine us more into your likeness. And Lord, this Christmas, Lord, Will you spur on our community to be a people who spread the word, who extend invitation, 
who have the eyes to see the people that you've placed in our world who are desperate for a saviour. Lord, give us a glimpse into people's lives the way that you see them. Help us to be that agent of change, to bring them to a place of encountering you. Lord, if that's an invitation to church or Lord, a conversation in the street, Lord, I thank you that you can use any encounter to be able to propel your gospel. Will you mobilise your church, mobilise your people, Lord, so that we will be your hands and feet, that we will show people your glory and that they will be amazed. We want to worship you, Lord, and be obedient to you. So Lord, will you speak to us as we worship you now?